All right, if you got your Bibles tonight, go to Ezekiel 33. So if you see uh, Psalms in the middle of your Bible, then you go to the right, and you'll see some big books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then you'll see Ezekiel. And uh, go to Ezekiel 33 for just a minute. You know, one of the things that we, you know, we're trying to do as we work through this um, series that we're on, on, you know, family type things is, um, uh, you know, we, we really want to help, you know, our children. Uh, we want to help them, our, our young people and our young adults, man, we got a bunch of young adults. You know, if the Lord does not return in the next 10 years, you think of where some of these young people are going to be age wise in 10 years from now. I mean, a lot of them are young and they're sitting here and, but 10 years from now, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have some young people in this room that, you know, they're going to be, you know, late twenties, early thirties. Uh, some of them will probably uh, be married and be raising children. And, um, and, and they're laughing as I'm saying it, I can see them <laughs> laughing all over the place. And yet it's true. It's true. Some of the things that we're touching on um, are um, they're actually a little difficult for me to talk about just just because I feel uncomfortable. But there are things that, you know, most people will not say anything about and they will not touch. And really, even tonight, as we wade into where we're going tonight, um, I, I trust that that you you understand that we want to help the generation that's coming. And that's in our hands, all of us that are older, whether you know whether you still have children at home or not, um, you still have influence, you have people that God's going to bring across your path. You will sometimes say a word in due season, the Bible talks about that, word in due season, and it will absolutely make all the difference in the world, and you will be unaware. Uh, perhaps you may never know that you said something that helped them dramatically. Um, you know that the divorce rate right now is, uh, you know, uh, just it's it's unbelievable. And of course, you know, the other the flip side of that is we have a whole generation. We've had it for a long time now that they don't even really see the need to get married. So they're rotating through partners. Um, uh, you know, um, and, and again, my goal tonight is uh, uh, my goal tonight is is not in any way to make anybody, I, I want you to keep remembering this because I, I have a feeling that every once in a while the devil gets on somebody's shoulder. I'm always praying, Lord, please don't let this be misunderstood. Don't let it be misapplied. Um, our goal is to exhort one another and exhort the, it, the, the main thought of exhort is actually positive and encouraging. Um, we want to encourage you. We want to spur you on. We want to help these young people. Um, uh, you know, we some of us grew up in homes where things were rocky. Uh, some of us grew up in homes where there were multiple marriages. Uh, you know, the home I grew up in, um, uh, my dad got saved when I was six, but he was married to uh, three women that I know of. And, um, and and there may have been a fourth one out there. Um, and, uh, you know, thank God dad got saved when I was six years old and the Lord of heaven entered our world. And it absolutely transformed everything from that point forward. Uh, but, but you know, um, so I'm not, I'm not coming at this from an idealistic perspective. I know there, there, there is, seems to be a fall, a flaw with, with some independent Baptists in that they, they present things. And, and bless their heart, they're trying to do the right thing. But they present things so idealistically that, you know, there's a lot of people in our churches that just feel like they just can't measure up. They they uh, they drop the ball somewhere, and so God can't use them now. And all that is absolute nonsense. Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Paul stood up and said, "By the grace of God, 
I am what I am. And God specializes in taking sinners and making and molding and remaking them and helping them. And that's what we want to do tonight. You know, we want our children to marry right, to marry well, to enter into marriage with their eyes open, to um, to have a correct perspective. Um, you know, you, you get some of these Christian young people and, uh, you know, they were raised in ideal settings. And this is this is our faulty thinking. We think, well, boy, I, I'm trying to cover too many things at once. I, I, I do believe... I do believe in being real careful to expose your kids to. Man, we've talked about that in weeks past. I do believe that. That's wisdom. But having said that, you get this thing in some independent Baptists, and I know them very well. That's why I'm shooting at them. Is they think, well, I've I've kept Johnny from all these evil influences, and I've arranged a marriage with Susie Lou's parents over here. And you know they go to the the same church or another church like ours, and and they've 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 done the same with her. So this will be a marriage made in heaven, and nothing can ever go wrong. Ha ha. Two years later, they're divorced, and somebody goes, "What happened?" Well, what happened is one of the things that happened is they weren't taught anything. This family thought if we protect them from everything, and, and you should, don't misunderstand me. If we protect them from everything and we protect him from everything and her from everything, that it'll just be wonderful. You know what? We live in the wickedest age. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And men shall be. Lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the air that we live and move in is absolutely saturated with evil. And um, if you don't teach your little Sally and your little Billy some really important truths, um, a whole lot of what you have done is going to go down the drain. So we're going to continue with where we were at last week, and we're going to try to move really quickly tonight. But but some of the stuff tonight and some of the stuff over the next few weeks is absolutely vital, okay? And and um, you may not agree with it all, and that's up to you. But make sure that where you disagree, that you don't disagree at your peril. You better make sure of that. Look at Ezekiel 33, just real briefly. I think that's the verse I gave out. Ezekiel 33, verse 31. Ezekiel 33, verse 31. The Lord said to Ezekiel, And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with the mouth... They show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. In other words, they, they were acknowledging the truth of what he was saying, but the problem was their heart. And the problem was they wanted what they wanted. So it didn't matter what the truth was because they wanted what they wanted. And that's what they were going to pursue. Verse 32. And lo, the Lord says to Ezekiel, thou art unto them as a very lovely song. Of one that had the pleasant voice said Ezekiel, they think you're the greatest preacher going. They love to come and hear you. And can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words. But they do them not. So I want to encourage you tonight to be careful of a pitfall. And I just say this by way of introduction. And this, this just applies, you know, all across the board. Uh, be careful that you don't fall into that rut of um, politely acknowledging you know, a lot of God's people, they're here, they hear truth. And, and if, you've, if you've been around the Bible any length of time, you understand the general slant of Bible truth. You know, you, you'll hear things and, you know, and, and you've probably heard things here in this church. You've heard things in other churches. And, you know, in a sense, you almost didn't need to hear it because when the preacher said this, and maybe you didn't know that verse was there. Maybe you didn't know that exact topic was dealt with. 
But you know, if somebody to question you and says, what do you think the Bible would say about this? You'd say, well, it probably, and you would give the general idea. You know, you just, you just, if you've been around this any length of time, if you've done any Bible reading, you have a very general idea of where the scripture leans. Okay. So um, the problem with God's people is they, they, um, with all of us, we, we all battle this is we get used to hearing things and we know they're true. Uh, you know, and we, we might, we might, there's some things we might try to argue with, but, but when it has to do with morality and right and wrong, there's some things that we we really, in our heart of hearts, we know, wow, <laughs> that's really true. But the way that they escape it is they go, wow, that's true. Next. It's like, no. God wants you to take what you're going to hear, and he wants you to do something with it. That is the, the purpose. It's not like a special song that you sit and enjoy. No, it's, it's something is to be done with that truth. And we need to remember that. Um, all right. Last, uh, last Wednesday night, we were talking about things to teach your daughters. And uh, we, we, we started off with, um, um, you know, teach them to um, do away with that competitive spirit. We talked about that. Uh, be yourself. Don't don't feel threatened, and um, and actually we spent we spent a lot of the evening right there. Oh, and then we we jumped into we need to teach our daughters what to look for in a man. Um, you know, there's got to be a whole lot more. You guys know, you guys know, there's got to be a whole lot more to this than Prince Charming, because I guarantee you. That 95% of the broken marriages that are out there, uh, it, it started with Prince Charming. You know, they didn't marry this guy going, this dude, he'll help me be as miserable as I've always wanted to be. <laughs> oh, I love the way he shirks his responsibility. I know I'll hate this later. Come, baby. <laughs> is, is that what they do? No. Every marriage starts off with Prince Charming. Why does it end in disaster? Because she didn't know what she was looking for. She adopted the Hollywood idea that, you know, if he said the right things and, and boy, just made her feel special. Oh, my soul. He, he ought to do that. And, and, you know, when we talk to the guys, we'll, we'll get there. But, you know, that's something that ought to be there. But there's got to be a whole lot more. A whole lot more. So uh, we mentioned some things last week. We mentioned, you know, not impulsive, not hot-headed. Oh, my soul. Boy, if, if he's got a temper. And some of these things, the only way you can do it is you got to pray and you got to seek the Lord and you got to say, God, please show me somehow, some way, through his friends, through his family, through some experience we'll have together. Show me. Show me where his red line is. Show me how readily he defaults into the red line. Show me how quickly he blows his stack. You need to know that. You, you must know that. Or dark days await you. You must know that. We'll say, who can reveal it? Oh, the whole, God will reveal it. If you get on your knees by your bed and say, Lord, I like this guy, but Lord, there's just a whole bunch I don't know. And say, Lord, would you show me what I don't know? Oh, he will answer that prayer if you'll give him some time. He will answer that. Not a hothead, uh, having self-control. Um, and here's the no-brainer. Um, does he love the Lord? Does he love the Lord? And you say, well, how do I know? Would you look with me real quick at 1 Corinthians 8? 1 Corinthians 8. Verse that we've looked at before. Oh, we need to teach our daughters what to look for. You know why? Because we want their marriage to be happy. Is, is any marriage on earth perfect? Of course not. Uh, and yet, the, the, you know, because you, you take two imperfect people and you put them together and you can't you can't expect perfection. But you get two people that love the Lord and they're moving towards God and they're being Christ <clears throat> being Christ like towards each other. It can be sweet. It will be happy. It will be blessed. 
it will be pleasant. Okay. And isn't, isn't that what we want for our daughter? Do Hey, listen, I, I, it's a dumb question. Do, do any of us want our daughters to marry a jerk? No. You know what? We have a whole lot to do with how that turns out. We have a whole lot to do with that. Um, first Corinthians eight verse three. It says, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. So in other words, you know, don't take his word for it. You know, if Prince Charming comes along and he's a great guy, he's from a great home, he's from a great church, and and um, and that's all as it should be. Um, and so now, um, don't take his word for it that he loves the Lord. Um, you, um, If he loves God, he, he won't have to tell you. I remember in Bible school, there was this girl, she would get up to sing. And uh, uh, we had chapel services three times a week, and that was during the day, let alone the church services in the evening. And so they always had special music, and this girl would get up to sing. And she'd always give this little testimony before she sang. And she would always say, and, you know, I just I just love the Lord so much. And, and you know, what? it was sweet, and, and I think she was sincere. But I'm telling you, she didn't last very long, and I'm not talking about college either. I'm talking about it was a year or two in after I met her, and she was in a bad way. The Lord says if somebody really loves the Lord, it's evident. And the people in the distance that know him or her, they know it also. If any man love God, the same is known of him. Does he love God? Well, say, I can't find anybody that knows. Then you better steer clear. Because if nobody knows, that means it's not known. If a man love God, the same is known of him. Um, you know, they need to look for a guy that's got some discernment. You know, um, does he have some sense? Does he have some sense? Um, she needs to marry a guy that's not a flirt with everybody. You know, um, um, you know, there's there's uh, some of these guys, you know, they're just they're just you know, they're just they're just I, I don't know. They're they're not a they're just really friendly with all the ladies. Well, that that might be sort of cute while he's your Prince Charming and, and you might like it. But but you know what? When you get married, um, you're not going to want him flirting with all the other women. And you say, oh, he'll stop. And I say, oh, you're naive. Because you don't flip a switch and change who he is. Just like you don't flip a switch and change who you are. Because who you really are continues to be who you really are. So you've got this thing where, where he's just, you know, he's always flirting with everybody. It's like, uh, hmm. I, I realize that before people are married, you know, they joke around and they, and, and I understand some of that's normal, but all of a sudden, all of a sudden you're seeing this guy and, um, and you're, you, you guys are getting serious and he's still wanting to play the field, dropping, dropping. Can he stick with the job? You say, well, I really don't know. You know, he's, you know, I, you know, he's, he's, he's just new to all this. Then, then you know what? Then you need to, we need to teach them. Wait till you're sure that he can stick with the job. Wait till you're sure. And, you know, there's just several things you can you can go with from there. You before you you know, when you start, get, be, I guess something you need to remember and we need to teach our girls this. Be careful how soon you give your heart away. You know, you reach a point there. You reach a point, a girl and a, and a guy, too. But a girl reaches a point where now she is madly in love with him. And once they reach that point, it's almost um, beyond the point of no return. When they reach that point where they've given their heart away, oh, but I love him. It's like, man, you just can't reason with them. And you need to, and they need to understand, like they, they need to not be fast to give their heart away. Um, does this guy have any debt? 
I'll never forget when Joey and Mary were starting to see each other. And, um, um, you know, Joey lived in Thompson. We were living in Prince Albert at the time. And so it was, uh, I think it was about eight hours away. And um, Joey's nervous right now. And um, <laughs> uh, about eight hours away. And, and you know, they were starting to see each other. And, and, and for us and for us and our girls, it, this wasn't a game. It wasn't, oh, let's, let's, um, let's hang out with him for a while. And, and then let's bounce around him for a while. And are you going to get married? No, it's just fun to bounce around to the guys. It's like, no, we weren't going to do that. And our girls understood that. So, you know, but they reached marrying age and I wasn't going to stop them. You know, there, there's always extremes. I was more than happy for them to get married. I just wanted them to marry some guy that was going to love them for the rest of their life and take care of them. Is that unreasonable? I want some guy that's going to treat my daughters like he loves them like nobody on the planet for the rest of their life. That's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? Amen. That's the way it's supposed to be. And so, Mary, how old were you guys when you guys started seeing each other? Mary was 22. So Joey comes on the scene, and I thought, I got to get a note. I got to find out some things about this guy. So I called a guy in Thompson in his church that knew him well, very well. And thank God he would spill the beans. You know, you, you, you know, don't, you know, it's, it's, it's no comfort when you call him and you get this answer. Oh, he's a great guy. Oh, you better get a whole lot more information than that. So what does that mean? Because a lot of times just you, you know, you get somebody that's like Bambi. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. So we're going to make it all sound nice. And this guy could be a serial killer. It's like, no, tell me the truth. And I called this guy, real good friend of Joey's, a little bit older than Joey, business owner in the, in the town. And I said, what can you tell me about Joey? Man, he started telling me. And I said, uh, along the way, I said, uh, in fact, I, I don't even think I even got the words. I was going to ask him this question. I was going to say, how is he with money? Now, I didn't realize some, some of our Baptist guys, they've got a screw loose. And they, 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 they go to this extreme. Well, if he doesn't have $25,000 in the bank, he can't even approach my daughter. It's like, oh, come on. Like, you know, that's not, if you can find a guy like that, that's great. But there's a lot more to character than just having money. You know, some of the crookedest people in this world got lots of money. You got $25,000 in the bank. Well, he's not telling you, see, it's a dope deal from last week. <laughs> but you guys know what I'm saying. You guys know what I'm saying. And he said to me, he said, I've never seen anybody as good with money as Joey Lounsbury. He said, uh, and he told me the figure and it was impressive. He said, he's got so many thousand dollars in the bank and said, he just, he just saves money right and left. Well, was that, was that, did that close the deal? No, no. Cause there's a lot more to this picture. That's just, that's just. <laughs> That's just one, you understand that's just one piece of the pie, but it sure is an important piece of the pie. It's, it's just one piece of the pie. You know, there are several pieces of that pie. But your, your daughter needs to understand. You know, well, she, well she's, she's going to marry this guy and he's, he he's, he's doesn't make much money and he has very little money. I, that's okay. That might be the will of God. But, you know, is, is she okay with that? And then the question is, is why, why is it? Why is it? Is, is he terrible with money? Does he blow money all the time? Does he give it away to, you know, naive things as fast as he gets it? Is he, is he spending money on video game things? What is he doing? You need to find that out. And you need to ask. And if you can't find that information, you back away. You need to teach your daughters. Why? Because someday they'll thank you. They will hug your neck and they will thank you. Or they will curse you. Say, why didn't you warn me? Um, we need to teach them what to look for in a man. And um, we need to teach them a willingness to wait. Okay? And when I say that, I mean, to not be boy crazy, not be boy crazy. Um, you, when you get a, when you get a, 
young girls that are boy crazy, they're just all too ready to give their heart away. And um, they're all too ready to, and there's various reasons why that happens. Um, but, but, but it, it suggests something. Now I realize, I realize a girl can be boy crazy and maybe she's just, maybe she's just crazy in general. Maybe she's ditzy and, and that's just the way she is. Okay. So I, I realize that, but often it suggests, it suggests she's starving for male attention. Daddy, are you listening? Give her lots of attention, your attention. I realize you, you got to work and you got to do everything you got to do. And, you know, you know, we're not trying to be extreme and we're not trying to make things hard. But 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 daddy, they need your attention. And if they've got lots of your attention, they won't feel such a deficit. To the first guy that comes along who showers them with attention and showers them with all this flattery about how beautiful they are, how wonderful they are. And how and, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they are filling this gap, this big hole in their being that has developed. And boy, they gravitate to that. Um, so we need to uh, we need to uh, you need to watch for that. So people, as their kids grow up, they get they get you've got to stay tuned in to where they are. Uh, remember the story of Esther and Mordecai. Mordecai was her uncle, and he, he had to raise her. And you find him um, every day by the king's decree because Esther was beautiful. So suddenly she gets taken out of his home, and she's in the king's castle, and he knows what's coming, and he can't stop it, and nobody on earth can stop it. But every day he's outside of her window talking to her, talking to her, and he's got his finger on the heartbeat of her life. And that's what we got to do with our children. We can get so busy and we get so oblivious and we lose track of what's going on in their heart and in their life. And, and, um, and sometimes that's where our problems come from. Um, um, you know, um, and you know, you don't want your daughter hanging around a bunch of other boy crazy girls um, because, because all of a sudden they're going to wind up in some guy's arms. And why is that? It's because nobody taught them, don't go there. And if they understand that, look, sweetie, when the right guy comes, you can run into his arms and, and I rejoice. I've told my girls on numerous occasions, I said, when the right guy comes, boy, with, you know, Elizabeth, uh, Mary got married early. Um, uh, Elizabeth and Charity was much later. And we would have these conversations Remember conversation, 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 converse. It's huge. We have these conversations and my girls knew. I told them repeatedly, I said, girls, I said, I will rejoice the day that I walk you down the aisle. I said, I'm not trying to keep you at home till you're 40. I said, I have no desire, none whatsoever. to. I want that right guy to come and I want to usher you into his arms. And you know what? They believe that because I was telling them the truth. But I sure wanted to make sure he wasn't a clown that was deceiving me and deceiving her. Okay, mom, dad, you ready? We must teach them how a man thinks. Those of you in this room that are married and you, you ladies that are married, and, and this would, this is especially going to fall in your, in you ladies laps. Um, you know what? I, I just, honestly, I just, I just don't hardly understand how there can be any excuse for you as a lady. If you, if you're married or you have been married to not understand how a man thinks you say, what do you mean? I'm talking about modesty and, and, the, and the way that they dress. Um, we need to teach them that we, we must. And of course, more is caught than taught. We, we must teach them that. Can I, um, can I give you a few verses really quick on this thought? And then we're, we're going to get really specific for a few minutes. Go with me very quickly to Job 31, Job 31.
I've met more than one young woman that told me in conversation, she said, you know, I got married. And she said, actually, she said, I knew nothing, nothing. Now, you know what? I don't put anything past the lost person. But I just want to tell you, we need to talk to our daughters about this. It's critical. Look with me at Job 31 real quick. Job 31, verse 7. Job 31, verse 7. If my step hath turned out of the way and mine heart walked after mine eyes. And in the context, he's talking about lust and immorality. Okay. So he says, my heart walked after mine eyes. And if any blot hath cleaved to mine hands, then Job said, let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. If mine heart have been deceived by a woman or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door. In other words, he says, if I was playing around with other women and I was trying to get my neighbor's wife, that's what he's saying. Verse 10, then let my wife grind into another and let others bow down upon her. For this is an heinous crime. Yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges for it is is a fire that consumeth to destruction and would root out all mine increase. When the Bible speaks of, of the emotion that is involved in these kind of relationships, it always uses the word fire. And what an, what an amazing word, what an appropriate word it is. And, um, you know, um, immodesty ignites the fire. Igni immodesty fuels the fire. Okay. And I really don't think most of you would have any beef with that statement. Um, uh, look with me at first Corinthians seven, very quickly. I want to really try to cover territory in the next five or 10 minutes and get, get done here tonight. First Corinthians seven. First Corinthians seven. First Corinthians seven is all about marriage, divorce and remarriage. And, um, and actually it's a wonderful chapter. Some people are scared to death of it. And, um, uh, the Lord, the, the Lord actually makes a whole lot more allowance than, than most independent Baptists would, would admit. And, um, and so, but, but all that said, all that said, the Lord is, you know, look at verse one. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to, touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. So it means outside of marriage, a man shouldn't touch a woman. Okay. So that's the, that's the words of the Holy ghost. So he's moving down through the chapter and but notice what he says in verse nine. Um, so verse eight, I say, therefore to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but now watch if they cannot contain, let them marry. Now watch the wording. For it is better to marry than to burn. It's talking about burning in, in lust. Okay. So again, the, the, the word lust in, immediately, the, the Holy Ghost compares it to a fire. Okay. Um, I want you to look at Romans chapter one. Just back it to your left there. Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. Now, you guys know what this chapter is. Uh, you know, it starts off with um, um, this section, you know, starts off about verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. And then he navigates through the chapter. And then when he gets to the end of the chapter, he's talking about the folks that operate in Sodom and Gomorrah. OK, and you, you all know that you all that. This is one of the chapters that people hate in the Bible and they hate it even politically. Okay. But all that said, you'll notice the wording. Look at Romans one verse 26 for this cause. God gave them up into vile affections for even their women did change the natural use, the natural use into that, which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women. So can we, can we say something just real quick here? The Holy ghost says something. 
the man woman relationship is natural. It is not dirty. It is not wrong. It is not evil. It is not taboo. It is not just for childbearing. He said it is natural. God's beef was not with the natural use of it. God's beef was with something else. And you know what it is. Look, but look, notice the wording. And look, verse 27. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman. What's the word? Burned in their lust. One toward another men with men working that which is unseemly you know in the world there's an expression and it's not it's not a bad expression um you know you get two people they're madly in love and um and they'll say oh oh he is her flame oh that's his flame isn't it amazing how accurate the bible is they're using bible language and they don't even know it um and it's just, it's a picture of, of, of love that is in, and, and love is not a quiet, nonchalant thing. It is, wow, it's explosive. Real quick, I want you to see it in a good light. Look at Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter eight. Song of Solomon, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon eight. We need to teach our daughters this stuff, guys. I have heard ladies with my own ears, Christian ladies, respectable Christian ladies, mature Christian ladies who said, I'm too embarrassed to talk to my daughters about this. And what you just said in that statement is, is I want to stay in my comfort zone. I don't care if it hurts my daughter or not. That's what you just said. It's all about me, and I don't care about my daughter. That's what you just said. Mom, Dad, they need us. Look at Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Uh, look at, trying to find the reference here. Song of Solomon 8, verse 6. Song of Solomon 8, verse 6. Of course, so, the Song of Solomon is a love story. Wow, it's passionate from the opening lines. It's amazing. It, it's a wonderful book. It really is. Eight, verse six. Set me, one lover says to another, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. And what does he call it? The coals thereof are coals of fire, which had the most vehement flame. He said that flame is a, it's a raging flame. It's vehement. Um, you know, um, we need to teach our daughters some things about how to dress and especially, um, um, and especially when they're that age where men are noticing them and, and they're heading that way. And it's the natural course of things is moving. Um, we have to teach them some things, ladies. Um, look. You, you, sure, you married ladies, I'm just holding this because I want to see this. You, you know how man thinks, don't you? Surely you do. Uh, man, stuff that is tight. You, you ladies, and I'm trying to be discreet, but ladies are beautiful to men, and God made it so. Aren't you glad that God didn't make you ugly? Oh, I just wish he'd made me ugly. You don't think that. You know what makes you ugly? You know what makes you beautiful? There's a lot of things involved in that. But part of that is the body he gave you. If it's tight, if it's see-through, if the neck's getting low, if the skirt's getting high, um, and you, and here's where, the, here's where the husband comes in. And sometimes there's things you can't put your finger on. Um, there's some things that a woman can wear that it's, it, it's not in any of those categories. It's, you know, I, I don't see her cleavage and she's, she's not wearing a mini skirt. And yet there's something about that design. There's something about that material. There's something about the way it lays on her body. There's something there. And, um, and, uh, it's not modest. And, um, 
And if you're not sure, all you got to do is ask your husband. But here's the deal with all that. Um, and I, I do want to say this. Can your husband tell you? Can he? You know, this this thing of, of, of the husband being able to say something to the wife, sometimes that is just, you know what? I, I hope it's not like this at your house. But in many a Christian home, the man has learned that he can't say anything. I just, just want you to understand. Next time you call on God, he's not listening to you either. I don't care what warm fuzzies you feel. If you've silenced your husband, I'm sorry. You have crossed a line with God. I, I've watched Christian ladies, not so much here, but I've seen, I've been around a long time. I've watched Christian ladies walk, sometimes good Christian ladies, and they'll walk in. I'm going, oh, and I, I don't react like that, of course. That's just my internal reaction. I go, oh. let me ask you a question. How many of you have dogs? This is not a trick question. How many of you have dogs? Okay. Okay. Here you are. Tonight you had steak, okay? And, man, you you did that steak and maybe put some garlic on it, and, and you put the onions on there, and, and uh, man, you just, you just let it cook a while, and you took the lid off, and, and your dog's in the room. And your dog, he's, he's getting, he's edging close to the kitchen. And I don't know about your dog, but it has fell our lot to own two or three dogs that were very, um, very quick to, their salivary glands work well. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you see them, and you go, you see this big thing of drool. We had one that used to come and watch us in the kitchen, and I said, it was Elizabeth's dog. I said, Elizabeth, get that thing out of here. I can't stand to see drooling while I'm eating. You know what none of you do? You know what none of you do? You don't go, you don't, you don't resent the dog because of that. You don't go, oh, stupid dog. All he thinks about is food. <laughs> no. Tell me why that is. Because you understood that what's going on is you have just royally tempted him to the hilt. And what happens is what God programmed to happen. He's drooling. You say, well, those men weren't so dirty minded. Sorry, ladies. God doesn't accept that. God programmed us to drool. He did. And it's awful when you're in church and somebody walks in and you're going, and, and some of our men, we've got some really good men. And you know what? God's been really good to us here. There's been very little of that here, very little of it. But I remember we had one guy. We had one guy for a while. And I had I had two or three ladies come to me and said, Pastor, um, I caught him looking at us like, and he wasn't looking at our, our hair. And this kept happening. You know what, what's bad is um, when a Christian lady does that and then here's a good Christian guy who loves the Lord. You know what he's got to do? He's got to fight all his natural inclinations. And he's standing there and he's he can't even look over there. She comes up or she's standing right there. She's in front of him. She's in front of him during the songs and he's got he's got to make sure that he's gone. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves because he dare not look down because it's just really, it's like, wow. In my old church, there was a lady and I'm, none of you have done this. Okay. None of you have done this, but she was wearing a skirt. She was wearing this. She was wearing, there was nothing that you could put your finger on except that you could see, you could see vividly the lines of her underwear. Ladies, you need to teach your daughters how a man thinks. You need to make it so that if your husband, you know, and, and guys, you know, I, 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 I'm going to hit all this later. But, of course, if something he'd said, you say it's sweet, you say it nice. It's like, you know, what? a time or two, my wife's come out with something. And, and she'll say, she'll say, uh, you know, or she'll say it's really, uh, well, a lot of times she, it's just, she's just got it on. And I'll just say, I'll say, uh, honey, that's really pretty. In fact, it's like, wow, it's like. Too pretty. You know, I, I've, I've, 
I've, you know, and you know, it's, it's not that anybody's trying to do anything. Can your husband say something to you? We need to teach our daughters that this is terribly important. Um, Last point, Ephesians 5. You know, we need to teach our daughters that there, there is a time and a place for that. Uh, there, there is a, there is a time and a place where, where that, that will be, and it will be, it'll be wonderful. It'll be in its place. And of course, where is that? It's with her husband. It's with her husband. Which, which leads us down another trail. And the question is, and it's a topic for, for another time, but, but you, you know, things are in trouble when the wife doesn't want to attract her husband's attention, but she wants to attract everybody else's attention. It's like, you know, all of a sudden, wow, we're, we're in a really bad place here. Paul said, I will that women uh, address, them, address themselves in modest apparel. Go with me before you do that, before you hit, uh, before you go where I just sent you Ephesians 5. Look at 1 Timothy 2 real quick. So here's, here's where you wind up with this, okay? You wind up in the contemporary church. What do you have? You have these ladies on the platform, okay? Here's, here, if you don't, you say, oh, my, my daughter's not going to do that. You know what? If you don't lay some groundwork. If you don't do some of these things, you're going to create a problem, whether it be a premarital problem or whether it be a later on marriage problem. OK, you, you've got to deal with these things and you've got to deal with it in a way that it's sensible, it's reasonable, it's holy. It makes sense. Um, but you get you get up, you get in the contemporary church and you got these 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 worship teams on the platform and they're dressed in leather. And the skirts, you know, up here. I've seen, I've seen good Christian ladies. I've seen it in our church. They, they'll have a skirt that's sort of mid knee, maybe just a tad above. But as soon as you do anything, it's above the knee. And as they walk away, as they walk away, you're flashing somebody behind you. You don't even realize it. The thing is, it'd be nice if your husband could say, "Sweetheart, um, we got to do something about that. We got to." buy a new skirt or get that longer or something. We got to do something about that because otherwise you're allowing something. And you know what happens when you start allowing things? It just never seems to stop. First Timothy two verse eight. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting in like manner. Also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety. So he, he says that women should adorn themselves in modest apparel, and then he uses the word shamefacedness. You know what shamefacedness means? It's an amazing word. And this goes back to the sort of to the boy crazy thing, but it means rudely bold. The word impudent shows up a few times in Scripture. It's actually used of the strange woman in Proverbs chapter 7. Uh, shamefacedness means, by dictionary definition, it means an excess of modesty, an excess of modesty. And when a woman is impudent, she's rudely bold. There are some women that they just, they just don't seem to have much reserve. And um, I mean, we can all visit and talk and chat and I'm not trying to make anything awkward for anybody in this room, but I think you all know what I mean. I think you all know what I mean. There's a, there's a healthy line there and it needs to be there, but sometimes you sense and you, 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 you sense with some people, it's like, man, there doesn't seem to be a line there. God intended that there would be a line there. Um, all right, Ephesians 5.
Ephesians 5, verse 22. Real familiar verse. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And what I want to say with this last point is this. Um, we need to uh, we need to teach our our um, our daughters. We need to teach our daughters to to actually live for their husband as a service to the Lord. Um, I remember talking to our, our teen girls in Prince Albert. We had a bunch of them there one night. And um, I, and believe it or not, I am about done. And there was a whole whack of them there on the front row. And a bunch of them were that we had. Here we've got a bunch of really sweet girls. But in my old church, I had a bunch of rebels. And um, and I really did. And um, I had this missionary come to my church one night. He said, uh, Brother Newman, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your teenagers spiritually? I said, um, negative 3. And he said, yeah, that's what I thought, too. <laughs> you know, they just had this attitude that reeked off of them. And I remember looking at them that night and I said, you know, a bunch of you girls, I said, I said, you know, you're, you're going to enter into marriage with a very faulty perspective. Now, again, I'm talking about, you know, Christians marrying Christians with the thought of we're going to do this God's way. OK, I, I realize that's that's the way it has to be for it to work. OK, so I understand that. And I said, but a bunch of you girls, I said, I know what you're thinking. I said, you're thinking, I'm going to marry the man that's going to make me happy. And I said, you're looking at it wrong. I said, you need to think, where is the man that I will make happy? And they just stared at me. It's foreign to our thinking, isn't it? A lot of young ladies, they enter into marriage and unknowingly, you know what they have? They have a princess heart. They think, oh, Prince Charming, and I will be the princess, and, and it will just be, you know, he'll be throwing daisies at my feet forever. And, um, and of course, you know where that goes. It would be better if they entered in, and, and the men too, of course. And I'm going to get there with the men. But God's way is that we enter into this with a servant's heart. That is God's way. I want to close with a letter that um, I got a hold of. It was written from an old Christian lady who loved the Lord and had served the Lord all her life, and she was right around 70. She writes to a young Christian woman, and, uh, and here's what she said. This, this letter was written about 20 years ago, and this lady now is with the Lord. But she wrote this letter, and here's what she said. She was talking about her Christian life and serving the Lord, and she said, there were times that I became so weary that I didn't think I could go on. But she said, but like you said, it, it is the Lord that keeps you going. We just can't depend on ourselves. If we do, we just fail miserably. And there were times that I depended on self only to be a failure and depression set in. Seems like I would have learned by now that if I depended upon my Lord always, I would be that joyous Christian that I truly want to be. The older I get, the more I realize that I just don't know much. Or shall I say... I haven't applied what he has taught me. The flesh is so troublesome, isn't it? One thing I finally learned is to listen to my husband and just try to be what he wants me to be. There were many things that I wanted to do, yet I couldn't do everything. And he had to step in sometimes and say, no. It just about put me under, but praise my Lord. He reached out to this miserable poor creature and helped me. I also had a problem when people complained to me about something my husband decided or something my children did. But I'm so thankful that I never did lose it or tell them how I felt or even to shut up. Not that I didn't want to. But the Lord closed my lips and I praise him for that. 
We women can cause a lot of damage if we just let go and say what we feel at times. Once said, it is impossible to take back. But God can keep us quiet and meek if we only trust Him. She said, with your children, she said, just encourage them to know the Lord, to love the Lord, and to enjoy the Lord. She said, I believe this is one area I failed in with my children, to enjoy the Lord. But I can't go back and undo. Just keep going forward and ask the Lord to take the mistakes I made and bring glory out of my children's lives. I'm so thankful for my five children, and they are walking with the Lord today. And I pray that their lives will be one of bringing glory to the Lord more each day. I love them so much. Next to my husband, they are next. How precious they are to both of us. Well, I suppose I've rambled enough. I hope that in this letter, it will help you as you trust him to give you the wisdom and the strength in rearing your children and being your husband's helper. Just remember, find out what your husband wants you to be or do. And then do it. You may have to say no to others. But just say yes to your husband. And pray for him. That the Lord will give him the wisdom that he needs. If we can get this into the heads of our daughters. Their marriage will not be a statistic. God knows we want our daughters and our sons to marry right, to have happy marriages, to raise their children for the Lord. And you know what? You know what we're doing tonight? We're just pointing towards the goal. And someday, again, your children may be grown. Years ago, I heard a preacher say, he said, my daughter came and asked me a question the other day. He said, my daughter has not asked me a spiritual question in the last 15 years. And he said, but today she sat down with me and she said, Daddy, what do I do about this? She said, it, he said, it's been a long time, but God opened that door. You know what? It's not too late. Just pray. And our kids can still have all the good that God has for them. But boy, we need to pray. And we need to teach them. So that at least they walk into all this stuff with their eyes open. And they'll never look back and say, Mom and Dad, why didn't you tell me? You don't know how many times I've heard a young woman say to me in my ears, my mother never taught me. The purpose of what we're doing here is just to, man, let's stop that trend. And let's teach them what they need. Don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be intimidated. Do it sweetly. But teach them what they need. Let's pray. Lord, bless the truth, we pray. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord.
Lord, help us to affect the next generation, God, for thee. Lord, bless, use us, we pray. Use our words. Use these thoughts in these kids that are going to be parents in the near future. God, breathe on these things for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. The uh, teen choir, or the young people's choir, I think is going to have a brief practice here. Thank you.